It's a pleasure to be sharing this Bible study with you. We pray that you have a wonderful week. We pray that this study will assist you on that. We pray that this study will empower you further in the knowledge of the Lord, which is the most important knowledge in the whole world. We are studying the Westminster Larger Catechism. We are happy to do so. We are excited about this study. We are on question 112 about the requirements that God brings to his people on the third commandment. Remind, let, let us remember the third commandment, demanding that all God-fearing people do not take the name of the Lord God in vain, for he is not going to consider guiltless anyone who takes his name in vain. So that's the commandment. And as all the commandments, we have the positive aspect, the negative aspect, the duty is required, we have the sins forbidden. So let us look today on the duties required by the third commandment. But before we go any further, let us pray and let us ask for God's blessing on this study. Let us pray. O oh, blessed be your name, Almighty God. For you are good and kind and compassionate. And Lord, we ask you for your many blessings to be upon us. Teach us, O oh Lord, more about who you are and cause us to walk in a way that is worthy of your name, so that your name may be glorified as Christ taught us on that blessed prayer. Hallowed be your name. O Lord, may indeed, may we live in a manner that your name will be seen to be holy, for it is holy. Bless us, O Lord, at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let us, let us consider, let us read. Huh? The third commandment requires that the name of God, his titles, attributes, ordinances, the word, capital W, meaning the scripture, the holy, the holy writ, sacraments, prayer, oaths, vows, lots, his works, and whatsoever else, please pay attention to this, whatsoever else, there is whereby he makes him say himself known. Very important, this part. Meaning, all these previous elements, his names, titles, attributes, ordinances, the word, sacraments, prayer, oaths, vows, lots, and his works, are all, are all ways through which God makes himself known. Okay? So the third commandment requires that all of this be holily and reverently used in thought, meditation, word, and writing. So, whatever, whatever form of speech, whatever thought, whatever consideration, suggestion, any form of communication from us to ourselves or from us to Him, the God, Lord God Almighty, and from ourselves to our neighbors, that in all these considerations, ponderings, words, statements, suggestions, that in all of this, God, in whatever way, whatever he uses to make himself known, be spoken in a reverent manner, in a holy manner. As I like to notice that when, I, when, I, when, I'm, if, when I'm teaching this to children, particularly my own kids, I teach them that whenever we talk about God, and of course, not only talk, but also think, Whatever, whenever we talk or think about God, we have to be serious in what we say, and we have to be nice on the sense that we we speak about Him in a sense of all, with a sense of all. So we ought to give a holy profession, an answerable conversation. Meaning, I'll, I'll explain this more in detail, of course. To the and why do we do this? We do this to the glory of God and to the good of ourselves and others which I will also explain these details. Let us remember, the third commandment is about the holiness of God. Okay? So, we have already seen this first reverence. The third commandment requires that the name of God, His titles and attributes, and now we, we're going to look at the ordinances, whatever command God has given, that we do not make fun of that, but Sorry, that's the negative aspect. Let me let me bring the positive aspect. That whenever we think or say anything about these, that those things that are said or thought 
ought to be done in a manner that is holy and reverent. What do I mean by holy and reverent? Well, what do I mean by holy? So that I do not sin in the way that I speak, so that I do not sin in a way that I refer to it, that I consider it, that I explain it, so that my very explanation of it may not be a sin. Uh, I remember talking to one person once in New Zealand, and I asked this person, when you say uh, Jesus Christ, like, let's say you were surprised, somebody surprised you, and you say Jesus Christ, or you say, oh my God. Uh, I, so I asked this person, what do you mean by that? And the person said, um, no, that's nothing, just something that I say. That is not a man, that is not the way to portray God as a holy God. And that doesn't speak of God in a reverent manner, obviously. So you, the holiness in the way we say, with the way we consider it, the way we think of it, and the reverence for the subject at hand. So when I say subject, I mean the topic of conversation, which can be God, or in this case, of course, God, uh, ought to be spoken in a reverent manner. Okay? Um, I, I'm very tempted to go into what we should not say. I'm trying to control myself. I'm immediately going to the things that should not be done but that's the next question question 113 so i'll try my best to to focus on what should be done instead of what should not be done so how do we speak of god we speak of him in a way that is serious and nice <laughs> in a way that is that we describe and portray his holiness to the best of our ability and that we display the proper reverence that is befitting to him which is perfect which is complete which is total so let us see Name of God, titles and attributes, previous study. Today, we continue from ordinances. Let us read Malachi chapter 1, verse 14. And then we're going to read Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. But cursed be the deceiver, who has in his flock a male, and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts. And my name is to be feared among the nations. Next, walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil. Now, what, what do we have here? We have here an ordinance of God, such as his worship, clearly. Look at this. Um, takes a vow, sacrifices, Oh, the context here is the context of worship, which is an ordinance of God that he be worshipped properly. That's the entire subject of the second commandment. And we also have here, see, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 1, walk prudently, means think, before, think well. When you go to the house of God, once again, the context is worship. And draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. So look at this. Draw near. There's a commandment. And draw near to hear. So may, may, may your words be few. May your ears be very well attentive. Very attentive. As the saying goes, we have only one mouth, but we got two ears. So may the mouth do the job of one and the ears do the job of two. For we are to hear way more than we speak. So what we see here is that God is saying, what, what I have commanded people to do, particularly worship, on, on this, the, the, all the references here are for worship. So when you see here ordinances, we ought to be thinking that the theologians of Westminster meant the the commandment of to worship him so that his worship be spoken of in a, in a holy manner we do not make jokes about the worship of and once again me i'm going to the negative aspect when we speak about the holy service of god service to god the holy worship of god we speak of it in a way that is that uplifts it 
especially guys uh, keep in mind especially when we are in front of non-christians everywhere every time of course but especially especially look at this holy profession and answerable conversation particularly to the ones that are not of the family of the faith like jesus said it is inevitable that scandals shall come but whoever deviates doesn't matter who does even the smallest one even the the little ones whoever deviates them from the path of the lord it would be better for them if they were to tie a massive rock to their necks and plunge on the sea i mean die so jesus is saying death would be a, 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 a an easy an easy path for them compared to the punishment that will come upon them if they deviate somebody from my path tough words tough words now here's one thing that i know about jesus i have never seen him making a threat without overblowing i, I never seen jesus over speaking i never seen him meaning level three but what actually took place was level two or level one I, I never saw him making an empty threat. N never seen. Never will. No one have never seen and no one ever will. So we see that the ordinances of God, his worship, ought to be considered holy, ought to be spoken of and be deemed as a, as a holy matter. Once again, why? Because the worship of God are one of the means through which we get to know God. How many millions if not more, of people have come to know God inside the worship service. And God wants us, wants that topic, the, the, the worship of His holy name, not only because of us also, but not only because of us, primarily because of the glory of His name. So we ought to speak of that and consider that as a holy topic which causes us to think. If we are to think about it or speak about it in a way that is reverent, how much better should be our behavior during the service? Now you may be thinking, oh, Philippe, I'm not wrecking the service. I'm not bothering anybody. I, I'm just there quiet. I'm not being irreverent. Well, it depends. Hope, hopefully not. Hopefully you're doing a great job. But, if you are, if you come to church to pay attention, to praise the Lord, to sing to Him with an honest desire at heart, that's awesome. If you are one of those that wake up and think, ah, oh, today I gotta go to church, that doesn't display the holiness of God. That doesn't, that doesn't match. That doesn't match at all. And another thing. Look at what the Bible says. Draw near to hear. Draw near to hear. Rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. When you go to your church. When you go to the public worship of God. Go with the express and eager desire to hear. Not to be. Not to look like a fool. One way that this is commonly done once again there are exceptions i understand if your saturday was a hectic saturday and you there's nothing you could do about it and you happen to be sleepy on sunday that's fine but remember this to be sleepy on church on a frequent basis it's not that doesn't do anything to display the holiness of god it doesn't do anything to display the holiness of God at all. In fact, you look like a fool. You look like a fool. Giving the sacrifice of fools. Continuing. The name of God, his titles, attributes, ordinances, and now the word. The word, the Bible, the holy writ, the holy scripture, the blessed revelation of Christ. Psalm 138 verse 2. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving... Oh, forgive me? Yeah. For your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above your 
above all your name. Now, look at this. The word of God. Look at this. You, you have magnified your word. The, the word of God is the purest form of the revelation of God. There is no source of revelation. There is nothing that can teach you and I about God better than the Bible. No philosophy of man, no pure logic, pure reason cannot. Cannot. See, reason doesn't judge the Bible. The Bible judges reason. That's one thing that many atheists do not understand. That many people fail to understand that reason comes from God and not the other way around. It's not something that God achieved or God happened to have. It's that reason exists because God exists. So look at this. You, God, have magnified your word above all your name. Listen to this. Listen to this. I, I saw this pastor in Brazil that you can say that he had good intentions and uh, he wanted to do a, a, an event, an event in Brazil, an evangelistic event for young people mostly, not only, but his target audience was uh, young people and he he belongs to a church that actually they do a great job in terms of uh, helping people get out of, of a life of drugs and, 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 and all that. They have a good, they have a wonderful actually social work. Nevertheless, one of the pastors of this church wanted to do a, an, wanted to advertise a program, I think an afternoon with the young people. And he his target was young people that had drug addiction, particularly cocaine addicts. Um, so as, in, as far as I'm concerned, cocaine is something that you 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 take that in through you through your nose, right? So I think people they, they close one side of the nose and and they it's, they call it snorting cocaine or something. So anyways, this pastor wanted to say, well, his point was, instead of snorting cocaine, why don't you snort the Bible? So he had a, a, the, the, the banner of his program was like this, him with an open Bible and like this, smelling, it's not smelling, snorting the Bible. And, and the, written in big words, big letters. Uh, snorting the Bible. Once again, he had good intentions. Let us, instead of instead of doing drugs, why don't you do the Bible? But you're gonna agree with me. That is not a holy and reverent way to make use of the holy book, isn't it? You're gonna agree with me on that, aren't you? Understandably, there was a massive complaint. Now, if you'd have simply said, instead of taking drugs in, why don't you take the Bible in? But snorting the Bible, I mean, if, even non christians saw that and thought, that's, that's not right. Look at this. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Now, for God to magnify one thing above his own name, you think is that even possible? Once again, please notice that this is a psalm, so this is this is a music. This is music. The point here is to transmit is to transmit not a technical description. That for technical descriptions you go, for example, to the letters of the Apostle Paul or to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. There's a song. A song is, desi is designed to transmit uh, an emotion, a feeling. It's, in, it's uh, intended to captivate, to, to, to have a... N not a set of detailed instructions, but to communicate one big thing. And the point here, of course, is to say that uh, God doesn't, doesn't give any credit to anything beyond the scripture. Uh, anything, nothing gets the credit that the scripture gets. The 
of all the things that the Lord has given us, the scripture is, is the highest one. It's the highest one. You can only know God's name through the scripture even. So that's the point that this the biblical poet is making here. So a reverent, a holy attitude towards God in his holy name ought to be seen in, in the sobriety, in the seriousness, and in the respect that it must be displayed when we, we refer to the Bible. When, um, so the worship of his name, his deeds, ordinances, his revelation, they, they must fill us with awe. Fill us with awe. Now here's the thing. If you're not in awe of the scripture, you never speak of the scripture in awe. If you're not in love with the Bible, you never speak of the Bible in a lovely manner. You see, this commandment, right, this must be understood. This commandment is not about how you appear to others. I mean, think about this. Medit word writing, so how you speak, so of course that has to do with how other per others perceive, but thought and meditation. This commandment is not is not teaching you what God demands you to put on before other before the eyes of the of a third party. This commandment speaks of how you should be in your innermost place. So you you never keep you may be able to to refute to to steer clear from the negative aspect of this commandment you may be able to not uh, to not run into problems with the prohibitions with this commandment you may be able to do that if you never speak or never think about god in any way shape or form then yeah you're going to steer clear from the negative aspect but remember that we're dealing with the positive aspect what you ought to do so when somebody doesn't carry a reverent opinion, a holy opinion of the Bible, of God, of his titles, of his attributes, of his ordinances, his blessed worship, and of his revelation, you, you are breaking the commandment. Because see, God did not just say, the commandment is not only do not take his holy name in vain, but the commandment is consider his name holy, like the Lord's Prayer. Jesus did not, here's how Jesus did not teach the prayer. Our Father in heaven, may we never dishonor your name. He did not, the prayer was not like this. Even though this is true, this is perfectly biblical what I said. His prayer, he, the prayer he taught us was, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. A positive communication of the Lord, opinion of the Lord, and reference to the Lord. That's what is commanded here. Remember, we tend to think of the commandments. You and I, I, I see. I'm this. This is gonna be. This is online. This. I don't know. The Pope maybe maybe may watch this. I don't think so. But uh, anyone, any human being can watch this. And here's what I'm gonna say. You and I doesn't doesn't matter who you are. We have a legalistic mind. We all do. We are there is not, not a single human being have walked the planet Earth without a legalistic mind. And whoever says that they have not, well, why are you lying? Another reason for you to ask for forgiveness. We have a legalistic mind. And we tend to focus on how, on what we cannot do. But the Bible demands a proactive mind. In terms of the beauty of the Lord and how we consider such. And many other things as well. But for the present moment I'm going to focus on that. So remember this. The Bible commands that you speak and think and feel about the Bible in a holy manner. So I ask you this. Do you love your Bible? Do you really absolutely love it? If the answer is no, you're breaking the commandment. See, I did not ask you if you are snorting the Bible. I did not ask you if you rip off the pages to 
you know, YP or something. I'm not asking that, you that question. I'm asking if you absolutely love the Bible. If the answer is no, that's it. You're breaking the commandment. There's no questions asked here. No questions asked. Look at this. Look. Once again, the Psalms, they, they intend to give us a, a feeling, a, a package. It's not a technical observation. It's not a technical description. It's not a manual. The book of Romans may be a form of manual. The Psalms are not. And look at the heart of the biblical poet. I will worship towards your holy temple. I'll praise your name name don't take the name of the lord in vain your praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth you have magnified your word above all your name see he's going to praise god's name but the word was even above his name so that's what god commands us to have if if our if you say philippe my heart is not that that's not that doesn't resemble my heart. Now, thank you for your honesty. You have to repent from that sin. That's it. That's the only heart that we can have. That that's all. That's the only thing God accepts. That's it. That's it. Oh, but Philippe, I'm I'm not there yet. Well, I hope you get there soon. And I I, I same falls for the same goes for every other human being on planet Earth. For you, for your wife, for your husband, for your children, for your parents, whoever you are, whoever they are. That is the heart we must have about the word of Christ. Another one, the sacraments. This is the instruction of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24, 25, and 28, and 29. And when he had, he had given thanks, that's Jesus, he broke it. And said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now that's very important. Look at what he's saying. Do this in remembrance of me. Look at, look at the goal. Well, not the only. Look at one of the goals of the commandments, of the sacraments. To refer us to Christ. To point us to Christ. To remind us of Christ. Once again. Remembrance. Uh, what is it? Do this in remembrance of me so if if we're doing this to remember christ therefore that reveals us christ if that reveals us christ that falls within the third commandment in the same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you, as often as you drink it in remembrance again in remembrance of me now verses 28 and 29. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not to discerning the Lord's body. Very important. Who is supposed to take the Lord's Supper? Now this is not a Bible study about the Lord's Supper, but I want to talk about this. Who is supposed to take the Lord's Supper? First, somebody that is in full communion with his church. So he has to be a church member, not a church goer, not a church lover, not blah, 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 blah. A church member. Member. No, no shenanigans here. No, but you know, you know what's happened? It's that uh, I, uh, pff, uh, no, no. Are you a church member? If you're a church member, you can take the Lord's Supper. Second. Not in discipline, in full standing, of course. Third, you must understand what you're doing. You must understand what you're doing. Look at this. Drinks and eat in an unworthy manner. Now, you, that, that demands scrutiny, so not for kids. People that, or people that do not have a, a, a well-developed brain, which is the case of every, every child, and some people that have a mental conditions doesn't matter then no age matters on this case should somebody take the lord's supper yeah yes of course they must they must if you love the lord if you believe the lord 
if you profess the Lord, then you should be taking the Lord's Supper. Oh, Philippe, what if, what if I'm not living a life that is worthy of the gospel? Repent. Repent, confess, and change. That's it. Repent, confess, and change. Now changing, remember about remember that Christ demands a penitence, an act of penitence. What is the act of penitence that Christ commands? For example, let's say you're caught stealing. What is your act of penitence? Your act of penitence is to spend the rest of your life working hard, never stealing again, and helping those who need assistance. Those, that's not my opinion, that's the opinion of the Apostle Paul. So change is not... Many people hear change and they think, okay, stop stealing. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches stop stealing, start working. So remove the negative, include the positive, and then you include another one. That's, that's a life of penitence. When I say act, I don't mean, oh, okay, uh, I'm going to buy... I don't know, I'm going to give a thousand dollars to a homeless guy. And then I'm good. No, no. It's not a one-off. It's a one-off if that one thing endures your lifetime. Okay, then it's a one-off. <laughs> so, anyway, so coming back here. So, the, the Lord's Supper is something that, if you believe the Lord, you ought to seek that. I know people that they, they take a lifetime, they spend a lifetime on church, and they don't, they don't take the Lord's Supper and they, they think that's okay. No, you, you, you're basically making a public statement saying, I still don't believe the Lord. That, that's a big problem. Capital B, capital I, capital G. Big problem. So you, you, you're basically saying, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Now, I understand that you may have been taught a bad theology. I, I get that. I sympathize with that, and that's sometimes difficult to, to get out of. But notice how I said this, difficult, not impossible, not impossible. You don't need a gazillion years to change your mind about a topic that you're poorly taught if you're receiving from now on good teaching. You don't need that. You really don't need that. But let a man examine himself. So. On the Lord's Supper, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are saying, this, this is a moment that I'm going to be remembering Christ even more. This is done to me, and I'm joining with the, on this event because I want to think about Christ more. Now, once again, this is a commandment. Commandment. Now, Philippe, I... I what if I don't take the Lord's Supper? You should be taking. But what if I'm not in a, in a place that I, I, I can't afford to do that? Well, I'll repeat my words. You should be. Philip. what if I'm not there yet? You should be. But Philip, how do I keep this commandment until I get there? You don't. You don't. You don't. You see... If you consider the sacraments a holy matter, but you don't engage in them, then, then, then it's the same as saying, oh, I love apple pie. Oh, have you tasted it? No. Oh, um, I don't know, orange juice is one of the greatest gifts of God to me. Oh, how often you drink orange juice? Mm, no, I, I don't drink it. It's good. I, I don't drink it. Now, you see, my I have a boy at home that has is four years old. He would look at you and say, Huh? This is serious. This is serious. See, many people may read this and think, okay, when you come about the Lord's Supper, if you take it, if you take it, you, you, you do it right, rightly. 
that's where they get wrong. That's where they get wrong. It is, if it's a sacrament from God that God gives, once again, it's a gift. I don't know of a single culture where refusing a gift is, is seen as okay. I, I, I don't know. On the United States, which is a, tend to be a very relaxed cult, culture about so many issues. Same, same goes for Brazil, same goes for Canada. It's not okay in many of these places to, to refuse a gift. If the person who gave you the gift find out that you abhorred the gift or that you don't want to use the gift in any way, shape or form, the person that gave you the gift will think, why did I bother? Why did I give it to you? And I'm not talking about those kind of gifts that many people despise, such as, um, I don't know, was you were at your workplace and they had a, a, a secret Santa game and, I don't know, you bought the first socks that you saw on your way to work and uh, you gave to somebody. I'm not talk That's not the kind of gift I'm talking about. I'm talking about a gift that is dear to the one who is giving. Let's say you, you spent, you gave somebody a gift that it cost you a lot. It cost you a lot. And you find out that somebody speaks of it well, but don't even interact with your gift. How would you feel? Now, when God gave us, gave, gave to his people, his only, his, his only begotten and holy son, and that son gives us a sacrament. And we don't engage on that sacrament. How, how do you picture him saying, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah I know. I know, it's okay. Can you, can you picture that? Serious stuff. Serious stuff. So the sacraments. Or parents. Parents that believe in the Lord. And they don't, and they refuse to baptize the, the children. Now, I understand that there's a whole, uh, there's a whole, whole section of Christianity that believe that baptism should be uh, given to only people that have discernment. They extend this discernment to both sacraments. I, I disagree. For example, this on the Old Testament. The, the visible sign of entering into a visible into the visible community of the covenant was a sign applied to children when they were eight years old. If somebody was an adult and wanted to join, not eight years, forgive me, eight days old. If somebody was an adult and wanted to join, they would be circumcised. If he was born yesterday, well, when he's eight days old, he's going to be circumcised, no questions asked. Which, what kind of reason or, or consideration look at this examination look at this but let a man examine himself what kind of examination can a baby an eight days baby eight days old baby employ well, zero they may be able to say if they're hungry or not but maybe pretty much the only thing or in if it hurts not not a fountain of wisdom isn't it so I, I understand that. So once again, I understand that there are many Christians that do not, they believe that baptism should be given only to adults. God bless them. God bless them. But if you believe that should be given to a child and you refuse to give, once again, if you believe it should be given to a child and you refuse to give, or you keep without reason postponing that event, yeah, that, that is a great, that is a serious sin. There is a serious sin. Or if you already believe in your heart, but you do not engage in it, let's say you are an adult, and you claim to believe in Christ, but you're never baptized. Yeah, no, you're taking the Lord's name in vain, for sure. For sure. Now, we continue on the next one. Prayer. Prayer. I desire, therefore, that Paul give instructions to Timothy on how the Church of Christ should be, and how Timothy should guide his own flock. 
I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now look at how those prayers should be made. Look at this. They should be everywhere. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So prayer should be lifting up holy hands. By the way, that's a, that, that's a cultural aspect of, of, of the Jews. The a Jewish culture... When, when they pray, it's part, no, I don't think nowadays, but at that time, when they pray, they would raise their hands. They would raise their hands. Christians have preserved that culture particularly uh, for some, but for some particular moments. For example, the benediction on the end of a service. I myself, I do that. I raise hands. But then that's uh, the idea that is raising the sense of giving, giving the benediction. But on the Jewish culture, it was to be understood that you're also going to lift your hands when you pray. And they don't really raise hands like this. They, they go like this. They, they usually stand like this, and, and that's how they pray. Some cultures, I think, I forgot the name. I forgot which country it was. It's an Asian country. Uh, not, not, for, not on the Far East, but more towards the West region the western regions of Asia, central or western regions of Asia, I forgot which of those countries, or if many of them, when they pray, they pray like this, they pray like this, and when they say amen, they go like this. It's a cultural uh, behavior. It's not right, it's not wrong. Just like mm, Brazilians, when they pray, they do this. It's a, it's a common thing. I think many Americans, they do that and close their eyes. Uh, so, Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, a whole manner for praying. A whole. There, there's a list of things that ought to be ticked for for one for one to be praying. So it's just a, it's not simply just I'm oh, just going pray. Just anyone just going pray. No, no. Paul said he desired to see people lifting holy hands. I want to know who who has those hands. Now, is Paul saying um, only pe only sinless people can pray? Uh, if Paul would be saying that, if Paul had said that, then only Jesus should have prayed. Paul himself would never pray. If that was his point, only sinless people can pray. Paul would have, would have never prayed. So, wh wh what is this? What what is this holy hand? Hand, of course, is a figure. is a is a metaphor here, for the person's deeds. So people that live a holy life, without wrath and doubting, doubting the Lord. So they're praying to the Lord. They they should not be doubting the Lord. Wrath. They should be in peace with the Lord, not in anger with the Lord. And the Bible says that everyone that is not for the Lord is against the Lord. So with the Lord, or you love Him or you hate Him. Oh, but Philippe, there are many people that neither love him nor hate him. That may be their understanding. And I'm not saying they're lying. That's how they, that's how they perceive. Now, here's how God perceives. I will put you in one of two categories. The category of those who love me or the category of those who hate me. God splits humanity in two categories. That's it. That's it. So who, who is this without wrath? So he's saying, may people that love him pray. Now, notice this. This is a command. Philip, what, what if I cannot pray? You should be. You should be able to pray. I'm not talking about praying in public, perhaps. Perhaps some people may be... Uh, embarrassed, maybe some people have a speech impediment or whatever, they, they, they don't feel comfortable saying anything in public at all, they rather punch a knife than, than go in and say I don't know saying their name to a large audience, stage fright and all of that, I'm, that's not the point here 
But who, who, who can raise holy hands? Who can be without wrath against the Lord? And who is not doubting the Lord? His believers. Believers. Philip, what if I cannot pray? You should be able to. What if I don't have what it takes? You basically say you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're living a life that is that God abhors. So you are taking his name in vain. Because see, his name is holy. He ought to be considered God because he is God. He ought to be considered Savior because he is the Savior. He ought, he ought to be considered the Lord because he is the Lord. Well, if you don't consider him Lord, God, and Savior, yeah, you're taking his holy name in vain because his name is Lord. His name is Savior. That is his name. That's who he is. So you cannot, you cannot have it both ways. Or you pray and you love prayer. Or you're breaking the commandment. And God will not consider you guiltless. Many people reduce this commandment to, Oh, I, I don't say OMG. Oh, good for you, man. Good for you. Wow. How holy you are, really. When I think about holiness, I think about, I don't know, God, I think about baby Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and then you, like really, like <laughs> phenomenal. Like, no, Christianity in its pristine form. No, the, the commandment is not only about that. That's, that's, I, I'm even embarrassed to say that's where you begin. No, you begin, you begin way ahead of that. <laughs> the point of the commandment is, I will consider him and everything that directly connects to him as holy. That's it. And because I consider it holy, I love it. Because I love it, I'll engage in it. Otherwise, I'm just hypocritical as, as hypocritical can be. Let us consider in the next prayer oaths. Now, I'm going to do oath, oaths. This is a bad word for me in terms of pronunciation. Oaths and vows, I'm going to do them together, okay? They are quite similar. Let, let me try to make a differentiation here, okay? A vow is usually something that you, you say, I'm going to do. So, it's usually... Guys, don't, don't say, oh, Philip, I've heard of being used in a different way. Yeah, I'm talk, not talking about the exception here, I'm talking about the rule. A vow is usually considered something that you say, oh, I, I vow... Uh, not to do or not to do. It has to do with uh, with activity. An oath is usually it has to do more of it has a greater focus on the statement in itself. You are um, you are affirming that you, what you said it, it is it is true. Once again, there is massive overlap between both. Okay, uh, but. For example, you go to a court of law. I vow to say da, 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 da. So you may think, oh no, that's an oath. No, that's a vow. He is vowing to, to, and to do something. And what you do is to say the truth, nothing but the truth, nothing more than the truth, nothing less than the truth, so help you God. That's that's at least that's how the movies portray. <laughs> so it's a vow to do something. Now the oath is it can be a you say you say something under oath, so the focus is on, is on the speech. It's not really much of an activity, but the speech itself. So both are used. Both are the Bible recognized that they may be something of a, of. A, they can they may be religious in nature. I'm I'm not saying that all vows and oaths will be and necessarily will be used with a religious religious aspect and also lots look at this lots um, there you, you may be using this without without a, a religious connection you may you may not now if you connect but those things for as long as they're used for as long as God's name is used here, then they they gain a religious aspect and they ought to be considered holy you cannot make light of them here 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 i go again 
focus on the negative. You ought to consider them an extremely important and special and clean matter, holy, free from any corruption or deviation. So, yeah, I'll explain more as I go. Let's, so let's consider first the oaths. Reference 567, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 2. And you shall swear, the Lord lives. The Lord... So we have here this oath. You shall swear, the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in Him, and in Him they shall glory. I, I, I made a vow once. And I made that vow public. And somebody went there and said, Oh, you should not vow. You should not vow. Because uh, the Bible says, in the Sermon of the Mountain, Matthew chapter 5 until, verse, until chapter 7, you shall say only yes, yes, and no, no. Because the context there is Jesus rebuking the people of his time, and of any other time, that did what the people of his time were doing. So he was rebuking, rebuking a sin that may be done, that was done in his time and may be done in any other time. And the sin was, at that time, because the ninth commandment, thou shalt bear no false witness against your neighbor, has such a, a, a judicial language, the Jews were connecting this to a court. So you cannot lie at court, but you can lie anywhere, anywhere else. And... Uh, and they can, if they were caught lying, they they could say, "Well, I never, I never vowed, I never swore, I never swore." So they could just say, "Well, yeah, I'm gonna pay you on, on Wednesday." And then comes Wednesday, and they say, "Well, where's my? I came here to collect payment. Can you please get my money for me?" Oh, I'm not gonna pay you. Well, why not? You said you're gonna pay on Wednesday. Well, I did not swear. So you could only take them at their word if they would say, I swear. So whenever they did not say, I swear, they could say the sky was pink. So th their problem was they were not loving truth. So Jesus, Jesus did not, when people say Jesus revolutionized, no, he did not revolutionize a thing. He just said, this is what the Bible actually taught. So if you say, if you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. He was never forbidding laws or vows or oaths. Okay. So, in fact, the Bible do command them. Jeremiah, you shall swear. So do make a swear. The Lord lives. In truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. So you see, he's saying, you, you will say that. You're going to swear the Lord lives because you actually believe it. You're going to swear in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. Isn't this magnanimous? Jeremiah is saying, everyone that loves the Lord ought to say, I swear he, he is alive. How can I swear such? Because I have tasted it. I have seen that he is good. Not only that he is alive, but that he is good. The nation shall bless themselves in him and in him they shall glory what is this they shall bless themselves they, they shall use God on their blessings may God bless you may God keep you may God God be with you son I call my dad uh, it's a common Brazilian thing among Christians uh, your blessing your father or mother say God bless you my son it's a common thing um, many many countries do that it's a sign of respect, particularly on a Christian community, especially if you're dealing with somebody that is older than you. So, once again, you, the, the oaths, the oaths shall be considered a holy thing. So do not make light of oaths. Uh, once again, me being negative again. Consider the oaths, and that keeping your oath an expression of your love for the Lord. Because God makes himself known through that. When somebody makes you, observes you making an oath, taking a vow, 
the next one, which is once again, like, like I said, a lot of overlap. And they see that no matter what, you're going to be true to that word. They will think, well, he swore to God that he would do such and such. And he, no matter what, he will be truthful to that statement. Whoever watches that, they'll say, well, that, God, that Lord, that God is a serious God. Because he swore by God and he's keeping that. Even when it's a bad thing for him to, even when it's a not a profit for him, he still he, he keeps that. The Bible speaks of the man who swears to his own hurt, meaning, if if you swore, if that if that vow if that oath that you took, if that hurts you, so be it. Let it hurt. If that damages you, let it damage. If that kills you, let it kill me, but I do not break it. Because above that stand my stand my God, and I, I swore to His name. So we should, we should, we should be. If now you may take an oath, let's say you make an oath to I don't know, let's say you're a doctor, and you make an oath to the medical association that you belong to. Is that a religious enterprise? Is that a religious oath? Well, did you swear to God or not? If you swore to the medical association that you belong to, that's it. That's in between you and the medical association. Now, if you say, dear medical association, I swear to God that I'm going to do such and such and such. Uh, then you involved God. So the oaths that, and I'm not saying that you have, that you can go ahead and, and, and break your oath. There may be reasons. Uh, that's a whole different conversation. I'm not getting to that. Don't, it's a long explanation, okay? Uh, it may be that the association turned. God doesn't turn. It may be that they started making unreasonable demands. God doesn't make unreasonable demands. It depends. Uh, it may be that they have become political. Many have. Many have always been. So there may be problems with that. Uh, but once again, but God is none of those things. So if you swear to God... You gotta keep it, Philippe. Then I, I, I may I, I rather not swear. Fine, but if you swear, if you swear, you gotta keep it. But now here's the thing: there are some oaths that a Christian take the moment he becomes a Christian, such as this. Here's here's the testimony of Jeremiah: "You shall swear the Lord lives." That's why Jesus said. And those who are ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of them in the final day. Those that deny that they know me, I'm going to tell everybody, I also don't know you. Why? Because when, you're a, when you become a Christian, your automatic oath is, the Lord lives. Now, that's, not a, that's not an oath of, I'm a deist, I believe in a, in a divine being. No. Look, the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. God's covenantal name. The name through which he revealed himself to his people. The God. So it's not an, a testament of, of belief in, a, in, in, a, in, in deity, in a deity or deities, plural, no. The, the biblical Lord. The biblical Lord lives. That's that's the vow that you that's the oath that you make automatically when you become a Christian. Philip, I never raised my hand. I was not in that event. There was not an event. Well, if you were baptized, yes. Oh, but what if I'm a Christian and I never had the chance of being baptized? Well, I don't know if that exists, does it? What if I died in between my my conversion and baptism, like like the thief in the cross, like the thief in the cross? He 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 confessed one day, died on the same day, <laughs> a few minutes later. 
I said, yeah, that's going to be very rare. But in your baptism, in your but you see, he was not baptized, but he gave a profession of faith. He prophesied, he professed his faith. He even rebuked the other guy. Hey, you are the thief number three. Maybe number two, because Jesus was not a thief. So, so hey, you fellow thief. You zip it, okay? You speak of things that you don't know. You We deserve. You don't fear God even now? We deserve. This man doesn't. Jesus, please help me out. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Remember me when you enter in your kingdom. Remember me in kingdom related issues. That was it. That was it. That was, he was giving his profession of faith. That was that man's version, great version, by the way, of this statement The Lord lives. The Lord lives. Guys, this is not a profession of the lips only. This, this is a, a whole encompassing system of the way we're going to live. Let's pause here. Let's pause here and we're going to continue from the next Sunday. I'm going to, re I'm going to pray with you guys and um, in a few minutes I'm going to start recording the next one. We're going to continue from the next one on question number five, on reference number 568, which was once again quite similar. It's about vows, very much, pretty much the same as the oaths, okay? But for now let us pray and let us ask God's blessing. Almighty God, we bless you, we praise you, we worship you. For you are good and kind and compassionate, and there is no one besides you. Your name is indeed holy. Lord, let us live in a way that will display the holiness of the Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' blessed, wonderful, gracious, and most exalted name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. We'll be back soon. Bye-bye.